way in uh, study, knowing God through the Psalms. Psalms are uh, so rich, so diverse, covers so many different topics about life, about God, about living, about purpose. And um, we're in lesson four, and we want to look at this aspect um, of God, your guide, in the 25th Psalm. So let's pray before we start. Father, I pray that you anoint this word, not use the psalmist's words to give us direction, to show us how God leads and uh, Show us, O oh God, what is needed in Jesus' name. Psalm 25, verse 10 to 15. says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O oh Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great who is the man that fears the Lord. Him shall he teach in the way that he chooses. I want you to underline that. Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. This is the kind of man. He himself shall dwell in prosperity. His descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. His eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. So the result of, a, the, of being guided by God, the man that God will teach and guide in a way that God chooses, this man will dwell in prosperity, um, and his descendants will inherit the earth. Basically what God is saying that if we allow God to be our guide, then the outcome of our life is predetermined by God. And basically what it means is that um, we will be prosperous uh, in how we live our lives to the glory of God, how we will be um, prosperous to be able to continue to bring life uh, and uh, all the best that God has for us, His purpose, His priorities, and of course, his prosperity for our children and our children's children. So it gives us a lot of uh, hope and uh, inspires us in what we should be doing. So in the first point, we want to look at God, a God who promises us divine guidance. His guidance is not just human wisdom type of guidance. Uh, that you can get anywhere. You can get in a book. You can go and attend uh, TED Talks and uh, different conferences and uh, get some of this human wisdom and knowledge but God's wisdom is beyond this life beyond this world it covers everything in life and it covers us even in things that we don't realize we need things that we have never experienced before so we need that in our lives we need God as your guide and the psalmist discovered the secret of that so God promises us divine guidance in Psalm 32 in verse 8, it says, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. I mean, like, this is like, like someone that, you know, is like a coach. I don't know whether you have seen a tennis coach before or some kind of a sporting coach. But uh, lately in my neighborhood, there have been a lot of uh, tennis coaches that uh, bring their students there because there's a lot of tennis courts in my neighborhood. And I have been watching how they would teach this young students some of them are like you know in elementary school and and i realized that they take them from the very basic uh parts of of, of tennis the the important uh, uh techniques and uh, how they should stand how they should follow through their their, their uh, drives and how they hit the ball and they start with a simple thing and and they instruct them instruct them meaning they tell them why they should do what they do and then they guide them as they do it, and they counsel them, they watch them, says, I will counsel you, my eye upon you, and they stand very close, and they watch everything they do, and they correct it, and they guide them so that they can be successful in the sport. And this is how God is described in terms of a guide. So he's more like a coach, a personal one-on-one -on -one type of a coach that the psalmist is describing to us. So God promises us not just divine guidance and sometimes we look at divine guidance oh he's up there he's so busy he's got a million people a billion people to watch and guide you know no but he's there personal one-on-one -on -one coach in your life if you allow him so god has given us his promise of guidance psalm 25 verse 6 says remember lord your tender mercies your loving kindness for they are from oh do not remember the sins of my youth my transgressions according to your mercy remember me for your goodness sake, O oh Lord. 
So basically here it's saying that when God promises us guidance, you know, it's not like someone who has no stake in it. It's not like a stranger who promises you, say, okay, you know, if you've got problems, call on me. Or a doctor who says, yeah, you know, if you're sick, just give me a call. And, and, and they're always busy. They have no time to take your call. Uh, it's just a nice way of, and polite way of, of, of uh, socializing with people. God is not like that. He says, your tender mercies, your loving kindness. He's very personal. He's got a personal stake in it. So when God promises you something, and God promises you to be his, to your guide, to be your personal coach, He's making a personal promise. He's saying, I will be there when you need me. I will be there to guide you. And uh, it's based on, on not just new promises, it's based on old promises. It says, you know, they are from old. God's old promises gives new directions. And this is the reason why I believe that there's diversity in the Bible, but there's unity in the Bible. And I don't like it when some of the new, uh, you know, uh, uh, seekers-friendly pastors in, in, in North America begin to say, let's check out the Old Testament. Because when you check out the Old Testament, you know that most of the promises are gone. A lot of the promises are from the Old Testament. Promises of guidance, a lot of it, you know, and this is where we are focusing on the psalm. And, and, and some of these other old promises of God. So old promises give new directions. So don't cast it out just because they, oh, you know, it's for a different generation. No, it has application for you. Isaiah 58. I mean, you talk about prophecies, you talk about the patriarchs of old. Isaiah 58, 11 says, The Lord will guide you continually. He will satisfy your soul in drought. He will strengthen your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fall, fall, do not fail. I like that. It says the Lord will guide you continually. I don't know whether you have gone on a hike or a guided tour before, and there are guides who guide you. And uh, sometimes those guides that guide you, they guide you up to a point, and they bring you to, let's say, a city, you know, when you go on a cruise, and they say, okay, you know, you, you go on your own right now. And then they leave you. And you don't know where to go after that. You know, those are paid guides. God is not like that. He will guide you continually. He will satisfy your soul in drought. Meaning that whether you are doing well or whether you are struggling, whether you feel He's there or you don't feel that He's there with you, like in a time of drought, dryness in your spirit, this He's there continually. So part of His old promises is that, yeah, you know, He's got a personal stake, and he's going to be there by your side through thick and thin. So secondly, God's promises are dependable and trustworthy because of who he is. What he says goes. He's not a man that he should lie, the Bible says. Psalm 31, he says, you are my rock. You are my fortress. You see, a rock and a fortress never goes away. If you've gone on some of these tours in some of the uh, countries around the world, some of those fortresses that you walk in, they're like, 11th century, 13th, 15th century, and they're still as strong. They're dependable. They're built on a bedrock, and God's promises are even better than that. He says, therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. You see, if God doesn't lead you, if God doesn't guide you, if He doesn't fulfill His promise, then you know what will happen? His name will be defamed, right? And this is the important thing, is that if you walk with God, you follow his principles, his name will be glorified for his own name's sake. Basically, God is saying, I'm promising you and, I, and I'm swearing by my own name. That's his seal. B, God's promises are for the corporate good. Yes, it is personal, but it has corporate implications. It has body implications. Uh, Psalm 25 says, Turn yourself to me and have mercy. For I'm desolate afflicted. And um, of course, toward the end, he says, Keep my soul, deliver me, let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. It's about God, it's about the psalmist. But at the end, he says, Redeem Israel, O God, out of their troubles. You see, often we look at guidance as just affecting me. But the psalmist is suggesting to us that if God guides me, 
the implications of that guidance and the outcome of that guidance of God in my life will affect others around me. So God's promises may be for you that if you allow God to guide you, lead you, that your life will be blessed and your way will be smooth because God will clear the path. You know, it's, it's not just for you. It's for your family. It's for your community. Because if you follow God, if you are blessed, your family will be blessed, your community will be blessed. God's guidance may be for an individual, but it always benefits the entire body. That's the truth. Old Testament is the same. The new is the same. The church in the wilderness under Moses is a fine example of this because Moses got detailed instructions from God even before he led Israel. And then, of course, he carried over to when he was a leader. He benefited the entire nation of Israel. Let me say this. When you get instructions, when you walk with God and are led and guided by God, your family will be blessed, your children will be blessed because that influence of God the blessings of God doesn't just fall on you, and it falls on the church. Imagine, every individual who walks in God's path and plan adds to and completes the overall plan of salvation. If one man walking with God can affect an entire nation, how about an entire church? If every single one of us, we are led and guided personally by God, and we're doing what we're supposed to do, imagine the, the, the power and the ramifications of what we can do for God. So, point number two, God's principles for divine guidance. There are principles that God gives us in Isaiah 30, 21. It says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. Basically, it is this. Our ears need to be inclined to God. Our ears need to be tuned to God. God speaks. God guides, but not everybody hears Him. Let me say that again. God speaks, God guides, not everybody hears the same voice, not everybody receives the same guidance. It's not because God is not verbal, it's not because God cannot speak, it's because of us, the hearers. See, God cannot lead if it's not wanted or needed. God cannot lead if it's not wanted or needed. You see, if a person is just interested in doing his own thing, let me say this, his ears will not be tuned for direction. If you think that you're walking the right path, you don't start, stop to ask for directions, right? And that's the trouble with, uh, you know, the proverbial uh, thing about men not asking for directions when they are, uh, you know, traveling in a strange country, in a new place, and then they get lost and they don't want, you know. Because you feel like, I can do it. I can find my way back, you know, and you don't. So God cannot lead if he's not wanted. If he doesn't want to be, uh, you know, if he's not needed, God, God doesn't just bur burst the door down and says, okay, I'm going to insist. I'm going to drag you by the ear and lead you. Point one is this, God reveals his path for those who sincerely seek him. Psalm 25 verse 1 to 2 says, To you, who's the you? O Lord, is directed to God, I lift up my soul. He doesn't say, I lift up my voice. He doesn't say, I ask. He says, I lift up my soul. Soul is deeper than your body. Soul is spirit deep. He says, oh God, I trust in you. He's confessing that God is the only one. He says, let not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Basically, he's saying, you know, the psalmist is saying, God, without you, I can't do this. You need to guide me. You need to show me the way. You see, the truth is that you've got to really want His guidance. Because if you don't want His guidance, you will not get it. If you are not asking, why will you be listening? If you're not seeking, well, you're not going to find anything because you're not specifically looking out for something. And desperation for God's direction determines your final destination, really. If you're not desperate enough, you're not going to seek hard enough. So, God cannot lead if He's not wanted. He doesn't want to bust in and, and over, you know, uh, lord it over you. Two, you've got to be patient and not rush ahead. And that's the other thing. People who say, God, I want your direction. God, I seek your will for my life. 
but then they get impatient. So you got to be patient with God, not rush. Psalm, 20, Psalm 25 says, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. The suggestion there of waiting is that you need to be patient. You want direction? Hey, are you willing to wait for God to show you? Because sometimes we don't have the time for God. Sometimes we just want the shortest way, we want the farthest, fastest way. We just say, God, I want the will of my life. I want the most important thing in my life, but I only have half an hour. I only have one minute. I mean, like, if it is important to you, half an hour, one hour. I mean, we are willing to wait, you know. I know that uh, Jollibee, when it first opened up in Vancouver, there were people who waited for 12 hours. Some people went there at 2 a.m. in the morning to wait for the first day so that they can be the first in to buy Jollibee and buy the fried chicken. I mean, they're willing to do that. But I'm sure that some of these people, the same people who are willing to buy that chicken and wait for hours for a chicken or a ticket into a concert, they find it difficult to wait half an hour for God to show them the will of God for their life. They say, God, I'm praying for my life, partner. I'm praying for a job. I'm praying about serving you. But God, I only have half an hour. You know, if you don't speak to me, I'll just go ahead and do my own thing. And that's part of the problem, isn't it? We're in a rush to do everything, but we're not willing to wait. And even then, God will not reveal the entire plan of your journey. You have to trust Him. You know, He'll take you part way, and, and we see that throughout the Bible with Abraham, with Moses, with every single one of the men of God. He takes them and he just, okay, wait. Wait. Wait for the cloud to move. Does it move? Okay, just keep waiting. And God will only reveal each segment of your journey as you take each step by faith. If you're not going to step out, the Jordan River is not going to open, the Red Sea is not going to part, and then you're just stuck and you're saying, God, where are you? How come you didn't provide directions? Well, God is saying, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you to step out in faith. And of course, in point B, God reveals His ways to those who revere Him. He reveals those who revere Him. Psalm 25 says, Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. What, what does that mean? Who is the man that fears the Lord? You see, fear is not fear of consequences. Fear is more than that. Fear is a deep respect, a deep understanding that, that God knows everything. God is wiser than me, smarter than me, bigger than me, more powerful than me, and because of that, I really believe in it. Everything I depend on Him. I'm not going to move without Him first leading me. So reverence and respect for God's higher wisdom and higher ways ensures a consistent following up. If you don't have reverence for God, if you don't care for His wisdom, you don't care for God's way, and you don't really believe in it, why would you even even seek God, nor obey Him when He shows you. And then, of course, too, He's a personal guy who is personally invested. He's personally invested in true believers who know His greatness and goodness. You know, God is not like a Wikipedia. You know, Wikipedia, you want, you want information, you just go there about anybody or anything, cancer research, you go Wikipedia and you, you, you Google it and you find it. God is not just about information. God is about a relationship. He's not just interested in providing you information. He's interested in being a personal guide to you. And that's important for us. Do you respect Him enough to guide you? Especially when you go to treacherous ground. And you know, the truth is this, that many people who go to like Machu Picchu, they will hire guides. And the truth is, most of them don't know who the guide is. They go there, they meet the guide the first time. It's a stranger. And they put their lives in the hands of these guys. Guys who will take them up to the mountain, down the mountain for three days, up and down, up to 10, 15,000 feet up there. And they put their lives in the hands of these guides that they personally never knew. But they don't trust a God who is personally invested in them. And of course, uh, C, uh, humility is the open door for, to God's guide, guidance. Humility, the opposite of pride. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore He teaches sinners in the way 
the humble he guides in justice and the humble he teaches his way psalm 25 8. you see god does not deal with the proud because they have already made up their mind about most things in life the proud says i know i can do i'm okay by myself then god has a little time for that because they have already rejected god and true humility is a healthy state of the heart true humility is a healthy state of the heart humility basically is saying that you know i don't know and what i know i still need god to help me to understand and even what i have understood and experienced i still don't have the strength to do it that's humility it's not i've done it i've been there done it know it now i can do it no humility is the state of the heart in that we know who god is he is god i'm not and d follow these steps for god's guidance and you'll be fine psalm 25 verse 4 to 5 there are three things that you see in there show me your ways teach me your paths lead me in your truth so you got to ask god show me your ways god how how does god show you his ways unless you have a relationship with him unless you're walking with him daily i mean he can't show you his ways just once a week on sunday one hour he's not going to be able to show you his ways he only can show so much how about teaching you his paths how how do you teach someone your paths if you're not going to follow them and walk with them right that's what jesus said follow me if you're willing to follow and walk with him through paths up and down the mountain like guides through from base camp all the way to to the top the summit of the highest mountain on earth well if you're not going to follow then you know you're not going to be able to be guided and of course lead me in your truth lead me meaning saying meaning i put aside my own understanding lead me saying i think otherwise but i choose to believe your word your truth I have my own other things that I think would work, but I prefer your word than my own ways. And if you follow all those, you're going to see God guide you step by step, inch by inch, all the way to glory. Man. May God bless you. May you be led all the way. May you prosper. And may your life lead many others along the way in jesus name amen